Prime Log, uh, Prime Media audiences. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, today I am joined uh, uh, with a special guest. Uh, his name is Jeff Pierce. Um, he will be introducing himself. Uh, I'm <sighs> um, excited that uh, he is uh, joining us for a discussion on Ethiopia today. Uh, Jeff, welcome and say hello to the audiences. And you hello, can... audience. Yeah. She's not excited. It's all a big lie. <laughs> She's not excited at all. She's terrified of what I might do on here. And you guys should be too. Be afraid. <laughs> be afraid of what terrible things I might say. So, <clears throat> but no, seriously, thank you for having me. Yes, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, oh my. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know what is appropriate. Um, I write books. I used to work in journalism. I used to work in radio and television years ago. I was a magazine editor. Um, and then I happened upon the greatest story, real story that I think I ever found, uh, which is why I ended up writing this, um, which is about Ethiopia's uh, effort to fight back the uh, fascist Italian invasion. Um, it's an incredible story um, full of heroes and villains and uh, occurrences that you could not believe if it were in a novel. Um, and yet they all happen. Uh, since the season is, um, I mean, it's uh, Adua time, uh, we'll uh, end uh, our, uh, our discussion with that. Uh, but I want to get uh, I want to get back to your sh uh, last article that you wrote. Um, okay. uh, the title was uh, very catching. Uh, Ethiopia versus the new white supremacy. And the picture that you have on the article is uh, a picture of uh, two people, one with Ethiopian sign on it and the other with the European analysts. And uh, you see the European uh, analyst with over 20 microphones basically uh, the European analyst voices are you know amplified whereas the Ethiopian um, only has one mic so um, I mean from the picture to the article it really talks about um, how Ethiopian voices uh, in regards to Ethiopian matters are um, you know as is not amplified and we are looking for a European analyst or uh, American analyst, or um, we're looking for um, the outside um, world to kind of be the um, the experts on Ethiopia. I myself believe that you know uh, the world is a very small world now, uh, much smaller than <laughs> how it used to be, uh, thanks to technology and connectivity. Um, I believe that we are global citizens, that anything that happens in Ethiopia matters, you know, here in the U.S. and, and so forth. So um, my background is in public health, too, so I understand and believe in um, uh, global network and uh, global um, uh, and the whole globalization in general. But I do uh, agree uh, on some of the things that, on, on almost on everything that you wrote on that article. <laughs> well, that's, that's, uh, really, I don't think there's anything that's, really, that's a relief. <laughs> I don't think there's even anything that I disagree about uh, on that article. And I wanted you to kind of, um, I wanted to, I wanted audiences to hear about it. I want Ethiopians, especially in Ethiopia, um, uh, to kind of get to know you and where, where, where that came from and why you wrote something like that and what are the reasons? Oh my, uh, well that article, that specific article was born out of complete frustration because um, as you know, um, we're seeing, uh, it's like we're living in parallel worlds uh, there is a huge disinformation campaign aimed at Ethiopia uh, from the web. Pretty much our, the architecture is coming from the Western diaspora community um, in favor of the TPLF position. And the Western media being lazy, um, and I know how lazy they are because I used to work for them, um, 
is not doing its homework and they just accept like greedy chickens, whatever is fed to them and they'll take it and run with it. And the social media uh, sort of back and forth and jabbering goes on and on. It's not doing anything in terms of making any progress in terms of making the case. And this is not to say that I am, as I have to say again and again, as a disclaimer, I am not a advocate for the Abbey government. I am not an advocate for a specific Ethiopian political party. How could I be? I don't live there. I'm not a citizen of the country. I don't speak Amharic. I will learn. Uh, I better learn. I was on a Zoom conference only yesterday, uh, uh, day before yesterday, and um, no, it was yesterday, and uh, Professor Ephraim Isaac was speaking, and I couldn't understand him. And I would have loved to have heard his address <laughs> because it was eloquent, it was passionate, and I couldn't get it. Of course, it'll help me with my research. So the thing is, I have no right to comment on the more internal politics of what goes on in terms of party versus party, elections, whatever, in terms of Ethiopia. But the outside world, the Western media and how it's treating Ethiopia is very much within my purview, and I have a right to comment on it as I see fit. And this has been going on for a while. Nobody in terms of the Western media was hardly paying attention to the massacres that were happening in Ethiopia last summer. So then the Tigray situation comes along and we have this, but that particular article, I got very frustrated because I thought, okay, enough is enough. And it called for what some people on first impression think is an extreme position until you um, look at it closely. And you talked about globalization. Okay, so what did we see last year? We saw um, Black Lives Matter sweeping the world and we saw the taking down of statues of Confederate uh, figures and slave owners again. And that spread to the UK and it spread to other countries, so forth. I mean, the other thing too about globalization before we forget is let's remember because the rest of the damn world doesn't know Ethiopia had legations, diplomatic legations to Europe in the 1300s. They already were leading globalization <laughs> centuries ago and were treated as modern equals. You know, um, somehow the world forgets how progressive Africa is. Um, so we come to my concern in terms of what, are we, what is it gonna take to wake these people up to balance? And finally it hit me. All right, part of the problem is we've got amnesty Human Rights Watch, Crisis Group, and they keep screwing up and then they correct their little errors and say, oh, we used the wrong photo. We're very sorry about that. Oh, we have to apologize because our last tweet was highly bigoted. Oh, sorry about that. And then you see CNN, I think it was yesterday or day before yesterday. Oh, we used the wrong footage uh, for our great expose in terms of the decried, <laughs> latest decried massacre. Gee, kind of a big thing. And so it hit me a little while ago to say, you guys need to go. You are part of the problem. And who the hell made you the moral arbiters of the world? Especially when crisis group is funded by foreign governments, funded by foreign foundations. They're not accountable to Africans. Human Rights Watch is not accountable to Africans. Amnesty is not accountable to Africans. They don't answer to you over there. They answer to who's giving them the money. Um, and as I, somebody asked me today on Twitter and said, why do they keep messing with us? They put in a more <laughs> pejorative way. And I said, because they just don't care. They treat you like a problem to solve for them to solve. And if you look past the liberal language, and I am an old fashioned left of center lefty. Um, so it, took me a while to get to this leap. But after you get past the vocabulary, which is very woke and very liberal, you go, okay, what this comes down to is you still in the rich white North are lecturing Africans how to conduct their affairs. Screw you, get the hell out. Uh, and it sometimes it takes a bit of a, what on the surface sounds like an extreme position to um, see a truth. 
Just as last year, when people had to explain what defund the police means, we're going to have to explain, no, we're not saying, those of us who believe in this, we're not saying no to every form of oversight in terms of the international community um, of war crimes or crimes against humanity. Nobody wants that. Um, what, what you're asking for is you are not accountable to anyone. So where do you get off lecturing other countries on how they conduct their affairs? You want, you want to uh, solve the problems of the world? Why don't you go start with Putin in Russia? Because I don't see you like crying out for intervention there and rushing off to save the Crimea anytime soon. Oh, I see. It's only for Africa you seem to want to rush in and have your independent commissions. Funny how that works. So yes, I call it the new white supremacy because I think it's apt. I think it's very apt. Uh, this turned into a rant, but unfortunately, <laughs> this is how I feel about it. So we'll move on to the next question because I think I went on for a bit about that. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, I didn't want you to stop it because I, <laughs> why I brought you here. It's because I, I wanted to get behind um, why you wrote this. And um, I think uh, I feel like, you know, when you when you say, you know, why don't you go and um, go after other countries who have, um, you know, obviously other issues. And uh, if, I, if I can interject, the thing yeah. is they do and they don't. I mean, to be fair, yeah. they will do every so often a report on those, but it's a matter of scale. They're not, nobody's saying, nobody said when the Crimea happened, oh, well, you should like rush in and intervene there. And even if they did, the, how long did that last? Whereas how long have we seen the prolonged, constant, relentless campaign to, which is very well orchestrated in terms of intervention towards Ethiopia? But sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 absolutely not. This is a discussion, so absolutely. Yeah, um, I think Ethiopians in general need to understand um, I think it's also a, a matter of, um, you know, how do you, uh, I think the uh, Ethiopian government has um, put out several statements in the last few days in regards to um, uh, misinformation and also about, you know, questioning uh, internal um, uh, activities and, you know, to kind of remind um, the world that Ethiopia is a sovereign country and, um, there are just boundaries for, you know, how um, you want to um, uh, ask certain questions or demand or suggest uh, certain things. Because obviously, um, there are a lot of things that uh, every country lacks. I mean, I've been kind of amazed. I was, uh, this is the first time actually I had, I've, I've obviously been aware with, uh, of uh, amnesty, but um, I did a little homework, you know, trying to see about where do they get their funding. And I looked at all the campaigns that they have um, um, all it's over. It's an eye opener, isn't it? Huh? It's an eye opener, isn't it? It is. I mean, I, uh, and I looked at, you know, which campaigns are, you know, are doing well and are actually making a noise and which are not and how are they prioritized and, and so forth. And uh, I think, I believe it was 93 or 97% of their funding is actually um, given by private donors and they don't allocate it, you know, for specific um, work. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it made me wonder, okay, if, you know, most of the money that they're receiving is not allocated, how do they prioritize certain things? And I see their Africa um, um, advocacy is pretty hot. You know, and why is it hot? You know, why is it hot in Africa? Um, and I'm not saying Africa doesn't have problems or, uh, you know, possibly have more problems in certain areas, but why is it hot, hot in that region? Is there, you know, after all, what is amnesty? You know, it's, it's just another NGO, correct? Yep. Do we put it, do we put, um, you know, the same microscope that we do with other any you know um, NGO, and in fact, I feel like there are NGOs that are 
almost untouchable, you know, that they're to be trusted all the time. Um, but it seems like there are certain things that, and I'm not saying Amnesty doesn't do a good job and hasn't done a lot of things uh, in the world. They are and they have, but I also see that there are some ethical issues and that boils down to you. It could be your staff, it could be the environment, it could be the boss that's running it, or it could be people that are working there that are there for a mission themselves or the donors, because um, you know your donors obviously dictate the kind of work that you do, whether it's allocated for a certain project or not, whoever is donating, like you said before, and I think um, uh, someone had said that before too. I mean, if Ethiopia was the highest donor for Amnesty International, I doubt they'll be doing a coverage like this because I saw some of the things that they have done and, you know, in regards to Black Lives Matter. And I feel whether it's Black Lives Matter or yeah, with Black Lives Matter, I, I don't think it's enough. You know, their voice was not amplified enough. Um, yes, they did certain things, but um, you know, how do we, uh, as people, uh, I think we've already been fighting the misinformation. Um, I think Ethiopians are really um, becoming loud and defending um, uh, their country. But, you know, what are some of your suggestions uh, on how to, uh, you know, uh, how to promote, you know, organizations that are big like that um, to be accountable for the work they do, um, you know, because I feel like every organization is sort of running either for a click uh, to get attention or to get money, funding, more funding, and this whole aid world sometimes can be, you know, uh, a business. So oh, this um, is definitely what are business. this is definitely I mean, business. business. Um, if you look at the funding. Um, and I make no bones about the fact that, yes, part of my motivation when I first got on this was to an extent um, <laughs> fueled by personal uh, ire uh, and outrage. I had a, uh, and it's on public record, I had William Davison of Crisis Group come after me in a public, uh, in a private uh, exchange on Twitter and lecture me on how I quoted Jarwa Muhammad and uh, under false pretenses, by the way. And I, my way of dealing with that is, oh, you wanna do this? Okay, we're gonna go public with your mess. Uh, and so I outed the entire conversation uh, because what you did was highly unethical. Um, and then I thought, all right, let's look at who you are and what you belong to. And the more I looked, at first I thought his Ethiopia insight, I thought that was attached in, in some way to Crisis Group. No, it's his own little package of this own little newspaper, newspaper online. And it's highly unethical to be part of this so-called human rights group while trying to run what is purported to be an impartial journalism enterprise on the side. And you look in, I thought they were together is somehow. And then I looked and I went, no, this is a separate thing. And I thought, my God, how do, you, how do you ethically justify that? And these people are in the business. This is why I call them the crisis merchants, because they are in the business of conflict. They don't want to see Ethiopia's troubles end. They don't want to see South Africa's troubles end. They want to keep it going. They like to keep the pot stirring. And I've come to the conclusion that this is what they do. They stir up the crap. Um, and then I went deeper and I discovered that uh, these people, when you challenge them, the analysts have made a practice of, um, I don't wanna go into the details of their targets to respect the confidences, but I know of several cases besides myself where they have bullied and harassed other people who have questioned their uh, uh, public stances in terms of current events in Africa. They go out of their way to harass and bully people to the point where complaints have been brought against their own human, human resources department. These people are busy on the one hand, looking for transparency from the governments and the journalism and, and then in private, you go around bullying the people who criticize you. Hmm. 
that sounds uh, <laughs> that's an interesting way to run a humanitarian uh, rights organization, isn't it? So when we got to the point where um, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. Uh, yeah. So who owns the crisis group? Good question. Uh, it's an NGO like others, but they get their funding from. Uh, you can look it up. I mean, it is a it is a. You can look up the documents, and. To be fair, they are transparent about saying where they're getting, they're getting their funding from. But that doesn't mean they're accountable. If they get money from the World Bank, if they get money from, uh, uh, check me on this, but I believe it's either Ireland or Iceland, if they get their money from whole other countries and foundations, they're still not accountable to Africans. They're commenting on Africa but they don't report back to Africa. They don't report back to the African Union. They're not ca held accountable to them. Who is holding these people accountable? So when you, when you say, how do we get more responsible organizations in there? Um, pardon my phrasing, but I say, burn the whole damn operation to the ground. Take them all down, get rid of them. And then let's examine uh, how these things operate. Because right now, Human Rights Watch, is its headquarters is based in New York. <clears throat> um, they're not answerable to you. <laughs> well, you're here in North America and, and so am I, but they're not answerable to uh, Ethiopians. They're not answerable to South Africans. They're not answerable to Kenyans. They're not answerable to anybody. Um, we got to take the whole system out and examine, okay, fine, you're getting your money that way, but where is your representation? For God's sake, we're doing this show where right now there's a protest that's got more attention over the fact that the Hollywood Foreign, uh, uh, Foreign Journalists Association, or whatever it is, that decides the Golden Globes, it doesn't have one black member in it. And there's more play over that in the news <laughs> right now tonight than there is over the fact that all of these organizations are not accountable to anybody on a continent that they're talking about. Doesn't that seem out of whack to you? <laughs> you know, doesn't that seem like a real priority issue that we should address? What do you think, what are, I mean, for instance, I mean, I think there needs to be a complaint, um, um, you know, an official complaint by Ethiopians and by the government uh, about these organizations that are misinforming or, um, highlighting Ethiopia in a negative way. Um, what can citizens do? What should we, you know, do you complain? I mean, like, it's the you same. Mean, do you mean here, here in North America as a diaspora community or well, Ethiopians well, back in Ethiopia? Well, for diasporas, I mean, obviously we've been, you know, social, uh, social people have been vocal on social media and, um, but not just that, beyond social media, what can, you know, Ethiopians as citizens, Ethiopian citizens, especially in Ethiopia and the diaspora, do uh, to bring these, you know, complaints, issues. Because I mean, obviously, um, you know, organizations make mistakes. You know, some of them, you know, have been apologized. Like you said, CNN has apologized and so forth. Um, but how do you? It's almost like you know certain organizations are con are considered as their own government. They're like a government themselves. Yep. And you know, I mean, that's how I feel. It's yep. like they are a government themselves. Yep. And I see some of their staff, you know, completely um, misinformed. And the fact that they're the chief, or the fact that they're you know they work for that organization, and it's taken literally as you know as as it is, is, it affects Ethiopia. So how do we formally make a complaint about this? And it needs to be heard. Uh, and I mean, finding ways to actually be heard. Well, you've got two different strands here. And the thing is, it's less comfortable for me to comment on what Ethiopians should do within their own country, because as I said before, I'm not a citizen. So I can, I have some notions, but that's all they are. Let's, yeah. couch, let's couch this in the right thing. Years and years ago, I taught very briefly in Myanmar. Um, and you had at the time, this was a very closed off country, um, sealed off and run by a military junta. And to a certain extent, young people culturally look to Westerners 
for that same kind of validation that you're talking about that comes from, you know, white Western people. And I would say, look, I could be full of crap. Don't take on faith whatever I say. Question it. Always question what I say because I can be wrong. I can be full of it. And that is an empowering thing to say, hey, your teacher can be wrong. Question that. But for what it's worth, we have the two threats. It's easier in some ways to think about the practical, tangible action for the diaspora, diaspora communities than it is for Ethiopia, but I'll get to that in a moment. For the diaspora communities, I've become so frustrated that I advocate this, and I advocate safety in all things. So the thing is, last year, during the summer, we saw protests sometimes over um, between ethnic organizations and pro-Ethiopia unity organizations, which sometimes broke into violence. We don't want that. We never want that. Don't do that. Um, what I advocate, though, however, is, is fair at this point with socially distanced, wear a mask because <laughs> we're in the middle of COVID, go park yourselves outside the offices of CNN, park yourselves outside the offices of MSNBC. You could try Fox News, but I think you'd be wasting your time. Uh, park yourselves outside the offices of CBS, park yourselves outside the offices of the New York Times building. And the thing is, if you do that, that's an incredibly embarrassing move for these guys. If you, they'll see you, it's like, uh, maybe we should pay attention to the people who are right outside our building <laughs> who are like paying attention. That's my tactical advice because I'm not an activist. I'm a writer by profession. And so finally I'm saying, okay, we're going to shame you bastards, part of my French, into finally paying attention to the balance of the issue. Why is it that Deutsche Welle, um, if I'm pronouncing it probably, DW.com, can have an entire article on about Ethiopia with no Ethiopians in it? No Eritreans is an article that had, uh, I, I apologize for mispronouncing his name, but that's the only thing I'll apologize for, Kajetel Tronvol. Um, it had William Davison and Michaela Ron, three white people who were experts in the article and not one Ethiopian, not one Eritrean quoted an article about Ethiopian Eritrea. And they're still doing this crap. Um, so we do that. Uh, we go after the playthings and toys, as I put in the article of the TPLF and extremists and say, we're taking away your toys. You've been conducting this little social media campaign where you score little points on barraging people. No, your biggest plaything is the media and you suckered them really well, but we take that away from them. Um, this you start with that and with a more balance, then you can reach those who are setting, say, U.S. policy, those in the State Department to help change their opinions. You've got to go and say, okay, who is the EU listening to? Well, they're listening to France 24. They're listening to this media operation. So you park yourselves right outside the offices of the Guardian in London, <laughs> and you do that. So they have to go, oh, we better pay attention. Now, in terms of Ethiopians back in Ethiopia, again, respectfully, I think the best thing you can do is learn. Part of the problem is you have a very young population. Uh, as I understand statistically, and somebody could check this, I think a good portion of the population is under 30. That's incredible. They've been through so much. They've had 27 years, the TPLF in power. Before the TPLF were the Dirk, who, as you know, slaughtered, what is it, close to half a million people. These people screwed up and weaponized history. And you can blame a lot of that on white Western historians who came, came over and started to mess with it first. Um, to the point where I've had young people, and I'm not kidding, I've had young people approach me on Twitter DMs and on Facebook and other places and say, what should I read? I can't trust anything. Like everything seems to have a partisan view. What can I trust? That's my own history. And they're asking the white guy. <laughs> they're asking the Ferengi, <laughs> you know, my God. And it's not because I'm so damn special. It's because where else can they turn? 
So I made a personal decision. I'm going to write a new history of Ethiopia, but it's going to take me a while. <laughs> so in the meantime, uh, listen to the history podcast of Tarek, if I'm pronouncing the name properly. Listen to those who are giving you the unvarnished history that isn't weaponized. Go seek out good books, um, books that are, to be honest with you, many were probably written in the 50s or 60s, early 70s, before this crap started to happen. Because by the um, 70s, you started to see these white Western historians start to choose sides. And there could be pro Amhara, they could be pro Oromo, uh, they picked their camps. And then of course they did this and then blamed the Ethiopians for everything <laughs> while, they, while they set the tone for, and they're still being quoted. You know, you can go on Twitter and you see little screenshots of people's pages. And one wonders if they read the entire damn book or the entire article. And that's not history. That's propaganda, that's polemics. And the other thing too, as I would urge is, is for the Ethiopians in Ethiopia is pull, I'm uncomfortable saying with this because I don't want to overreach, but it goes back to the message that I said in one of those early articles, you are one nation, you know, maybe there are some who tell you not to believe that, but you are all of your peoples, all of your different ethnic groups built and developed the country together. They really did. I found the evidence for it. I'm going to write it. <laughs> I'm going to prove it because it badly needs to be proved. All of you are brothers and sisters. So the enemy is not the Tigrayan. The, the enemy is not the Aromo. The enemy is not the Amhara. Uh, as I found it, and, and I will double check my homework, but Johannes IV, as I understand, is the person who is from Tigray, one of the greatest emperors of Ethiopian history. And he's the guy that decided Amharic will be the national language for the sake of convenience and so forth. Well, once you come to grips with that and go, oh, okay. Okay, a Tigrayan emperor <laughs> said this. Once you come to grips with the fact that Menelik had an Aromo advisor as he made these and made uh, negotiations and had certain groups submit to him in terms of coalescing forces. Once you come to terms with the interactions of the ethnicities, then you can get past all this crap and say, we are so mixed together. Our histories, our destinies are so interlocked that this would be madness to tear each other apart. And I don't say that because of any vested interest. What the hell do I get out of it? You know, <laughs> What, what can I possibly gain? I'm not getting paid for this interview. I haven't been paid for anything in terms of this. I'm doing this because there are people like us who love you. An analyst. <laughs> Sorry? I said if you were an analyst. Yeah, yeah, if I was an analyst. But the thing okay. is, you know, um, sorry for mid-rant, but I'll give you an example. I'm a Canadian and you're an American. Okay. My country had a situation with our province of Quebec. And we had a terrorist organization that pretended to speak for the Francophone people. And I'm not going to claim the similarities are parallel, but certainly the Quebecois in the 1930s and 40s were treated like second class citizens. There were genuine grievances, things had to change. But a terrorist organization went around bombing things and killing people they took uh, hostage uh, a UK diplomat. They murdered a provincial minister, one of their own, Quebecois, uh, to the point where Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau, um, introduced what we have as the equivalent of martial law, the War Measures Act. And at one point, a very famous episode in our history, which I'm sure you're not familiar with, but every Canadian knows it is, because it's on film, a reporter walked up to him and complained about people being rounded up and arrested. Now, point of clarity, all of those people got financially compensated later by the government. We're like that, we're Canadian. We say, we're sorry, <laughs> here's some money to compensate you for your trouble and inconvenience of going to jail, which was still not nice, but they did. But this reporter complained about these war measures uh, in terms of armored cars on the streets and soldiers 
And the guy said, well, look, how far will you go? And Pierre Trudeau, Trudeau said, just watch me. Just watch me. And people went, oh, he's not screwing around. <laughs> he's not messing around. And the FLQ's response to all of this was to murder a politician. Now, up to that point, there were many Quebecois young people who liked to play revolutionary. But now things were serious. You know, they murdered a guy. And they seem to have forgotten that they also murdered people in terms of bombings and other things. But support drained away from these people. They're eventually uh, uh, found by the police. The UK diplomat was freed. Um, the terrorists were managed to escape to Cuba through a negotiation. They later came back. Uh, they were put in prison. They served time. Um, we have never had this kind of problem again. We had two peaceful referendums to decide whether Quebec should stay in the country. I am not even advocating for that kind of system for Ethiopia. You decide your own ways to deal with your own politics. That's up to you. What I'm saying is, is look to say examples like ours and see what you want. And I guarantee you, if you fragment into little bits, your enemies are going to love this. You know, there is the Egyptian regime, not the Egyptian people, but the Egyptian regime in Cairo, which is rubbing its hands together going, oh, great, this is wonderful for GERD. <laughs> you know, this, we'll, we'll fix this. There are other enemies who are just looking at this going, hmm, what can we do? You know, when the U.S. can't even deal with the fact that their own whack job of a president incites people to attack the U.S. Capitol, and then they want to turn around and lecture Ethiopia on how it deals with an insurrection where a military base gets attacked. Come back to us when you put Trump in prison. Come back to us when you solve that. Come back to us when you solve how you protect your own major legislative structure. <laughs> then you can lecture Ethiopia and other African countries on their sovereignty and what they're entitled to do. And I have no problems with saying that, you know, I mean, sorry, but you, you forfeited any moral high ground you had at all. <laughs> well, you did long ago. But the minute that U.S. capital attack happened, the U.S. forfeited any moral high ground over Africa. Hands down, period. Mm -hmm.